I've always wanted to be a cyborg. One of my favorite shows as a kid was The Six Million Dollar Man, and uh, this is a little bit closer to like The Two Hundred Forty Dollar Man or so. But <laughs> any rate, uh, and I would normally feel very self-conscious and kind of geeky wearing this around, right? But like a few days ago, I saw one world-renowned statistician swallowing swords on stage here, so I figure it's okay amongst this group. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about toys and the power that I see inherent in them. When I was a kid, I actually attended Montessori school up to sixth grade in Atlanta, Georgia. And at the time, I didn't think much about it. But then later, I kind of realized that that was kind of the high point of my education. From that point on, everything else was pretty much downhill. Uh, and it wasn't until later as I started making games that I really actually think of them more as toys. People call me a game designer, but I really think of these things more as toys. But I started getting very interested in Marie Montessori and her methods and the kind of way she went about things and the way she saw it very valuable for kids to kind of discover things on their own rather than being taught these things just kind of overtly. And she would design these toys where kids, in playing with the toys, would actually come to understand these deep principles of life and nature through play. And since they discovered those things, it really stuck with them so much more. And also they would experience their own failures. There was a failure-based aspect to learning there that was very important. And so the games that I do, I think of really more as modern Montessori toys. And I really kind of want them to be presented in a way to where kids can kind of explore and discover their own principles. So a few years ago, I actually started getting very interested in the SETI program. And that's kind of the way I work, is I get interested in different kind of subjects, I dive in, I research them, and then I try to figure out how to craft a toy around that so that other people can kind of experience the same sense of discovery that I did as I was learning that subject. And it kind of led me to astrobiology, which is the study of possible life in the universe, and then the Drake's equation, you know, which is looking at the probability of life arising on planets, how long it might last, how many planets are out there, stuff like that. And I started looking at how interesting Drake's equation was because it spanned all these different subjects, you know, physics, chemistry, sociology, economics, astronomy. And another thing that really impressed me a long time ago was Powers of Ten, you know, Charles Murray Eames' film. And I started kind of putting those two together and wondering, could I build a toy where kids would kind of trip across all these interesting principles of life, you know, as it exists and as it might go in the future. Things where you might kind of uh, trip across things like the Copernican principle, the Fermi paradox, the anthropic principle, the origin of life. And so I'm going to show you a toy today that I've been working on that really I think of more than anything else as kind of a philosophy toy. In playing this toy, do you kind of, does it bring up philosophical questions in you? This game's called Spore. I've been working on it for several years. It's getting pretty close to finish now. It occurs at all these different scales, first of all, from very, very small to very, very large. I'm just going to pop in at the start of the game. And you actually start this game kind of in a drop of water. It's a very, very small, single-cell creature. And right off the bat, you basically just have to live, survive, reproduce. So here we are at a very kind of microscopic scale. Swing around. And I actually realize that cells don't have eyes. but. Uh, it helps to make it cute. The player is actually going to play through every generation of the species. And as you play the game, the creature is actually growing bit by bit. And as we start growing, the camera will actually start zooming out. And things that you see kind of in the background there will actually start slowly pulling into the foreground, showing you a little bit of what you'll be interacting with as you grow. So as we eat, the camera starts pulling out. And now we start interacting with kind of larger and larger organisms. Now, we actually play through many generations here at the cellular scale. I'm going to skip ahead here. Uh, at some point, we get larger, and we actually get to kind of a macroevolution scale. Now, at this point, we're actually leaving the water. And one thing that's kind of important about this game is that at every level, the player is kind of designing their creature. And that's kind of a fundamental aspect of this. Now, in the uh, evolution game here, the creature scale, basically you have to eat, survive, and then reproduce. You know, a very Darwinian. One thing we noticed with The Sims, which is the game I did earlier, is that players love making stuff. When they were able to make stuff in the game, they had a tremendous amount of empathy and connection to it. Even if it wasn't as you know, pretty as what other people would make, as professional artists would make for games, uh, they really stuck with them, and they really cared about what would happen to it. So at this point, we've actually left the water, and now with this little creature, we could bring up the volume a little bit. And now we might try to eat. We might sneak up on this little guy over here, maybe. Try and eat him. Okay, while we fight. Okay, we got him. Now we get a meal. So really, at this part of the game, what we're doing is we're running around, surviving, uh, and also to get to the next generation, because we're going to play through every generation of this creature. Uh, we can mate. So I'm going to see if one of these creatures wants to mate with me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Also, we didn't want to replay actual evolution with humans and all that because it's kind of almost more interesting to look at alternate possibilities in evolution. Evolution is usually presented as like this one path that we took through, but really it represents this huge set of possibilities. Now once we mate, we actually click on the egg, and this is where the game starts getting interesting, because one of the things we really focused on here was giving the players very high leverage tools, so that for a very small amount of effort, the player could make something very cool. And it involves a lot of intelligence kind of on the tool side, but basically this is the editor where we're going to design the next generation of our creature. So it has a little spine, I can kind of move around here, I can extend. I can also inflate or deflate it with a mouse wheel, so you kind of sculpt it basically like clay. We have parts here that I can kind of put on, pull off. The idea is that the player can basically design anything they can think of in this editor, and we'll basically bring it to life. So for instance, I might put some limbs on the character here. I inflate them kind of large. And in this case, I might decide I'm going to put, uh, I'll put mouths on the limbs. So pretty much the player's encouraged to be very creative in the game. Here, I'll give it like one eye in the middle. We scale it up a bit, point it down. And I'll give it a few legs. So basically, in some sense, we want this to feel like kind of an amplifier for the player's imagination. So that with a very small number of clicks, a player can create something that they didn't really think was possible before. You know, this is almost like designing something like Maya that a like eight-year-old can use. But really, the goal here was within about a minute, I wanted somebody to replicate what typically takes a picture artist you know, several weeks to create. Okay, now I'll put some hands on it. Okay, so here I've basically thrown together a little creature. Let me give it a little weapon on the tail here, so it can fight. Okay, so that's the complete model. Now we can actually go to the painting phase. Now at this phase, the program actually has some understanding of kind of the topology of this creature. It kind of knows where the backbone is, where the spine, the limbs are. It kind of knows how stripes should run, how it should be shaded. And so we're procedurally generating the texture map. And this is something a texture artist would take many, many days to work on. And then we can test it out once we've done that and see how it would move around. And so at this point, the computer is procedurally animating this creature. It's looking at whatever I've designed, it'll actually bring it to life. And I can see how it might dance. How might show emotions, how it might fight. So see it's attacking with its two mouths there. Um, I can even have it pose for a photo. Snap a little photo of it. Uh. So anyway, then I bring this back into the game. It's born, and I play the next generation of my creature through evolution. Now, again, the empathy that the players have when they create the content is tremendous. Now, when players create content in this game, it's automatically sent up to a server and then redistributed to all the other players transparently. So, in fact, as I'm kind of interacting in this world with other creatures, these creatures are transparently coming from other players as they play. So the process of playing the game is the process of building up this huge database of content. And pretty much everything you're going to see in this game, there's an editor for in the game that the player can create, you know, all the way up through civilization. Here's my baby. When I eat, I'll actually start growing. This is the next generation. But now I'm going to skip way ahead here. Now, normally what would happen is these creatures would kind of work their way up, eventually become intelligent. I'd start dealing with tribes, uh, cities, and civilizations of them over time. I'm going to skip way ahead here to the space phase. Eventually, they would uh, go out into space and start colonizing and exploring the universe. Now, really, in some sense, I want the players to be building this world in their imagination and then extracting it from them you know, with the least amount of pain. So that's kind of what these tools are about, are how do we make the gameplay you know, basically the player's imagination amplifier. And how do we make the, these tools, these editors, something that in fact are actually just as fun as the game itself? So this is the planet that we've been playing on up to this point in the game. Uh, so far the entire game has been played on the surface of this little world here. Now at this point we're actually dealing with a very little toy planet. Uh, almost again like the Montessori toy idea. You know, what happens if you give somebody a toy planet, you know, and let them play with a lot of dynamics on it? You know, what could they discover? What might they learn on this? Uh, this world was actually extracted from the player's imagination, so this is the planet that the player evolved on. So things like the buildings and the vehicles, the architecture, civilizations, were all designed by the player up to this point. So here's a little city with some of our guys kind of walking around in it. Well, most games kind of put the player in the role of uh, Luke Skywalker, and you know this protagonist playing through the story. Uh, really, this is more about putting the player in the role of George Lucas. You know, I want them, after they played this game, to have extracted an entire world that they're now interacting with. Now, as we pull down here, we actually still have a whole set of creatures uh, living on the surface of the planet. There are all these different dynamics going on here. In fact, I can look over here, and this is kind of a little simplified food web that's going on with the creatures. I can open this up and then kind of actually scan what exists on the surface, and you get some sense of the diversity of creatures that were uh, brought in 
You know, some of these were created by the player, others by other players, and automatically sent over here. But there's a very simple little kind of calculation of what's required, how much uh, plants are required for the herbivores to live, how many herbivores for the carnivores to eat, et cetera. That you're actually having to balance actively. Now, also with this phase, uh, we're getting more and more godlike powers for the player that you can kind of experiment with this planet again as a toy. So I can come in and I can do things and kind of just treat this planet as a lump of clay. We have like very simple little weather systems you see here, very simple geology. For instance, I could open one of my tools here and then like, carve out rivers. So this whole thing is kind of like a big lump of clay, a sculpture. I can also play with the dynamics of this world over time. So one of the things I can do is start pumping more uh, CO2 gases into the atmosphere. And so that's what I'm doing here. There's actually a little readout down there of our planetary atmospheric pressure and temperature. So as I start pumping in more atmosphere, we're going to start pushing up the greenhouse gases here. And if you'll start noticing, we start seeing the ocean levels rise over time. And our cities are going to be at risk, too, because a lot of these are coastal cities. You can see the ocean levels are rising now. Uh, and as they encroach upon the cities, I'll start losing cities here. So basically, I want the players to be able to experiment and explore a huge amount of failure space. So there goes one city. Now, over time, this is actually going to heat up the planet. So at first, what we're going to see is a global ocean rise here on this little toy planet. But then over time, and I can speed it up just a little bit, we'll actually start to see the heat impact of that as well. So not only will it get hotter, but at some point it's going to get so hot that the oceans will entirely evaporate. So first they'll go up, and then they'll evaporate, and that'll be my planet. So basically what we're getting here is kind of maybe the sequel to An Inconvenient Truth, you know, in about two minutes. And that actually kind of brings up an interesting point about games. Now here where our entire oceans are evaporating off the surface. And as it keeps getting hotter, at some point the entire planet's going to melt down. Here it goes. So we're not only simulating kind of biological dynamics of food webs and all that, but also geologic, you know, at a very simple kind of core scale. And what's interesting to me about games in some sense is that I think we can take a lot of long-term dynamics and compress them into very short-term kind of experiences. Because it's so hard for people to think 50 or 100 years out, but when you can give them a toy and they can experience these long-term dynamics in just a few minutes, I think it's an entirely different kind of point of view, where we're actually mapping, using the game to remap our intuition. It's almost like in the same way that a telescope or a microscope recalibrates your eyesight. I think computer simulations can recalibrate your instinct across vast scales of both space and time. So here's our little solar system. As we pull away from our melted planet here, we actually, it turns out, have a couple of other planets in this solar system. Let's fly to another one. So in fact, we're going to have just an unlimited number of worlds that you can kind of explore here. Now, as we move into the future and we start going out into space and doing stuff, we're drawing a lot from things like science fiction. And kind of all my favorite science fiction movies I want to basically play out here is different dynamics. So this planet actually has some life on it. Here it is, some indigenous life down here. Now, one of the tools I could eventually earn from my UFO is a monolith that I can drop down. <laughs> now, as you can see, these guys are actually starting to kind of go up and uh, bow to it. And over time, once they touch it, they will become intelligent. So I can actually pick a uh, species on a planet and then make them sentient. See, now they've actually gone to tribal dynamics. And now because I'm actually the one here, I can actually, if I want to, get out of the UFO and walk up, and they should be worshiping me at this point as a god. At first, they're a little freaked out. Okay, well, maybe they're not worshiping me. <laughs> I think I'll leave before they get hostile. But we basically want a diversity of activities the players can play through this. You know, basically, I want to be able to play, you know, Day of the Earth Stood Still, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Star Trek, uh, War of the Worlds. Now, as we pull away from this world, we're going to keep pulling away from the star now. One of the things that always kind of uh, frustrated me a little bit about astronomy when I was a kid is how it was always presented so two-dimensionally and so static. As we pull away from the star here, we're actually going now out to interstellar space and we're getting a sense of the space around our home star. Now, what I really wanted to do is to present this, you know, basically as wonderfully 3D as it actually is. And not only that, but also show the dynamics and a lot of the interesting objects that you might find maybe like in the Hubble at, you know, pretty much realistic frequencies and scales. So most people, you know, kind of have no idea of the difference between like an emissive nebula and a planetary nebula. But these are things that we can kind of put in this little galaxy here. So we're flying over here to uh, what looks like a black hole. I want to basically have the entire zoo of Hubble objects that people can kind of interact with and play with, again, as toys. So here's a little black hole that we probably don't want to get too close to. But we also have stars and things as well. If we pull all the way back, we start seeing the entire galaxy here, uh, kind of slowly in motion. 
And this is another thing where like typically when people present galaxies, it's always been these very beautiful photos, but they're always static. And when you actually bring it forward in time and start animating it, it's actually kind of amazing, you know, what a galaxy would look like fast forward. This would be about a million years a second because you have about roughly one supernova every century or so. And so you would have this wonderful sparkling thing with the disk slowly rotating, and this is roughly what it would look like. And so really part of this is about bringing the beauty of this, of the natural world to somebody in a very imaginative way so that they can start calibrating their instinct across these vast scales of space and time. Now, uh, one thing that Chris actually mentioned to me the other day was he was kind of wondering what kind of gods that the players would become. Because as you think about it, you know, you're going to have 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds, whatever, flying around this universe, and they might be a nurturing god. They, you know, might be bootstrapping life on planets, trying to terraform and kind of spread civilization. You might be a vengeful god going out and conquesting, because you actually can do that and go and attack other intelligent races. You might be a networking god, kind of building alliances, which you can also do in the game. Uh, or just curious, going around wanting to explore as much as you possibly can. But basically, the reason why I make toys like this is because I think if there's one difference I could possibly make in the world uh, that I would choose to make, it's that I would like to somehow give people just a little bit better calibration on long-term thinking. Because I think most of the problems that our world is faced right now is the result of short-term thinking and the fact that it's so hard for us to think 50, 100 years, or 1,000 years out. And I think by giving kids toys like this and letting them replay dynamics, you know, very long-term dynamics over the short term and getting some sense of what we're doing now, what it's going to be like in 100 years, I think probably is the most effective thing I can be doing probably to help the world. And so that's why I think personally that toys can change the world. Thank you.